Thank you very much, um, Sara, and I'm thankful to the organizations which sponsored this event. It's, it's a great player and a privilege to be here to talk about on, the, on these issues. First, a very general disclaimer, which I'm required to say. Um, all what you'll hear from me will be my personal opinions, and those will not be representative of uh, uh, Department of Defense or National Defense University. Uh, well, whether I want National Defense University and DOD to have share those opinions with me, of course I do. Uh, but that's not the case at this moment, I guess. Uh, to help all of you understand where Pakistan stands today and where it is heading, uh, I proposed and suggested this topic, who will define or who will decide the future of Pakistan? Is it liberals? Is it extremists who we hear so much about? Or is it the military? Uh, military known for being very resourceful, very organized, very disciplined, seen as a cause of problem by so many uh, in the policy circles as well. So this is one larger issue. But before I get into this discussion, and what I plan to do is to first profile these three groups. What do I really mean by these three groups? How do I define these groups? What are they doing? What is the historical context? Where they stand today? What are their objectives and goals? And then I'll talk briefly about what, in my view, uh, really matters um, for, for us in the United States, for the global international community as well. And then a few provocative uh, recommendations at the end. I'll take about 40 minutes um, or so. But before even I start defining these three groups, I want to mention four factors that I want you to keep in mind. Um, just, just to set the stage, just to understand the larger context in which I'll talk about. First, I believe whether it is analyzing Pakistan or is it analyzing any other country of interest. And when in, we, we say country of interest, we normally mean um, security issues, conflict, um, troublesome areas. But for most, in, in most cases, we have become prisoners of the media cycle. Whether it is about a drone attack which happened yesterday, killing so and so, or is it about, or often it is about political statements, either from the Pakistani officials or from the U.S. officials. It is media somehow, it seems to me, that, has, that is, is playing a central role in defining the issue of the day. Well, I'm not saying media is not necessarily playing its role or that it is not sufficient. I'm making the argument here that it is critical for us to also see and understand that it is scholarship and learning and research-based analysis which is equally important. For us to look at any issue, yes, media, the day-to-day -day current developments are critical, but an important pillar of the same understanding has to be scholarly work and understanding as well. That's the first thing I want you to keep in mind. I had initially thought that I'll start my discussion with what uh, just Secretary Hillary Clinton said in Kabul about Pakistan, but then I thought that would be contradictory. Um, I'm myself saying I don't want to frame the issue as media frames it. Maybe we'll talk about that in the Q&A. The second factor I want you to keep in mind is that somehow or the other, our understanding of global issues today is overly security driven. Again, I'm not saying that is necessarily a bad thing. I'm only saying we must also recognize then that the larger perspective we have because of looking only at security issues is narrow and is not sufficient for understanding the larger context. The third point, just bringing in one point from the history of Pakistan, and critical for our understanding of the region, is that for Pakistan, a modern state, it's 60 years old, when it had come into being, the real gel or the real factor uniting about five major different ethnic groups was religion, Islam. So people, despite being in part of different economic groups, despite different ethnic um, orientations, 
despite those things, it was religion. And I, I encourage you to actually look at the map. Just go and Google and look at the map, which says, just say Pakistan and ethnic groups, and you'll find uh, that there is a Punjab in Pakistan, but there is Punjab in India also. The Pashtuns live in Pakistan, but Pashtuns are also a central part of the Afghan culture and Afghan society and Afghan state as well. Baluchis, Balochistan is a province in Pakistan, but there is a Balochistan in Iran as well. Same sin, in case of Sindh. Sindh, the major province in Pakistan, there are Sindhis who live in India also. There is a province uh, just bordering that. So it was critical at that in the initial stages of Pakistan to, to use religion, uh, which was used uh, quite creatively, I must add, by, by the Pakistani political leadership. But why I'm mentioning this right in the beginning? Today, in my assessment, and I frame it provocatively, it is the anti-US feeling which has become the u new unifying factor. And I am very carefully using the word anti-US feeling. I'm not saying anti-Americanism, which is very different, which you can say, because as soon as we say such a such person or such such society is anti-American, um, by that we normally mean, and that is defined by US policymakers as um, you are against the values, you are against democracy, you are against uh, the political philosophy, you are against the every thing that modern state stands for. I am not saying that. I am saying anti-US feeling, which is directly relevant um, to, to policy, their perspective on, on US policy. Whether these are two entirely different things, not exactly, but these are cons concentric circles. There is something in between, but there is something beyond that as well. Also, by saying that anti-US feeling is very fashionable in Pakistan, because defiance is seen, uh, is, is, it can be observed, it can be assessed, it can be um, felt by, by just looking at the political statements and the political movements that are going on in Pakistan. Whether if someone is anti-US, it immediately means that they are pro-Taliban and pro-Al-Qaeda? No. That clarification also is important. So this was the third point I wanted to mention. And, and last but not the least, we, we, we need to think about, while looking at Pakistan, that we are not necessarily only looking at the state. This is another phenomenon um, in, in the Western world. We assess states or crises in a certain region by looking at state structures because of our own reasons. Because here, if you want to see the health of a nation, you look at the state policy, you look at economy, you look at democratic patterns. So it's, it's very state institutions driven. Pakistan is in a region where it is not a law-based society. It is a relationship-based society. I'm not, again, saying it is a good thing or bad thing, but that recognition is critical. So these were just the four general factors I want you to keep in mind when I now delve into uh, profiling all of these uh, different groups. Let me start by extremists. We know of, of this war that is going on between the Pakistan and Afghanistan border region. Um, I, I, as a, before my academic journey, I, I was a police officer in Pakistan, though I'm often advised by friends not to mention that because they say, if, so long as you're an academic and scholar, that's fine. As soon as you mention police, it, it gives a different um, uh, background. It, it's a baggage also. But nonetheless, the point I'm making is I've, I've seen the area, I've traveled in the area. What has transpired or happened in, in that region, what we call federally administered tribal areas. These are agencies, seven agencies. It's also interesting to note um, that even in those areas where English, of course, is not their first language, English is their fourth language. Uh, they call their area where the, in the town where they live agency because this the word was framed by the British. This was a buffer zone between, Pakistan, between the British India uh, and Afghans. We only look today where Haqqani group is operating, where there are militants who are going from Pakistan into Afghanistan, attacking US forces, ISAF, NATO. Um, there is, I think, no doubt about it. There is enough evidence about it. But I just want to mention to you what happened very briefly, what transpired, because we, we need to understand um, the, the cause of extremism in this area, area and define what, what um, that really is. This was the area which was used at a, as a platform for the Afghan Jihad of the 1980s. Whether we like history or not, whether we want to always learn about history or not is another matter, but for the people of the area, it is the platform that was used where people from about 30 countries, um, from 
countries from Morocco to Yemen to Algeria to, to Egypt, you name a country, um, a Muslim country of, of the era, they had all exported their radicals to fight the Afghan war, to fight the, the Soviets, to throw out Soviets from Afghanistan. Those 30,000 people who went to Pakistan, we, most of us know this fact, where were they living? Where were they interacting with the other people? Tribal areas. These federally administered tribal areas, they've got married there, they learned their languages, they interacted with each other, they learned new ways to interact, to coordinate, to communicate with each other. This became a hub. When the Soviets were defeated, I have no plan to go into detailed history. The only point here is when the Soviet Union fell and all of these folks thought they, they have won the battle, all of us switched off our screens. Uh, for us, switching off the screen or shifting our focus from one region to another was easy. But the people who got sponsored in the process, the people who got brainwashed partly in, in that era, they stayed there. You just can't go and switch off a light in, in this case, that you'll switch off and their mentality will go away. There, there's uh, one history book on Taliban by, by a Pakistani general. Uh, Kamal Matinuddin, in his book, if you're interested, he mentions that there were about 25,000 madrasas which were built in that area, era during a, the rule of a military dictator in Pakistan, um, General Zia. And the purpose was, they knew Mujahideen were going into Afghanistan. They knew that the families, the orphans of those families who were losing their lives were coming back into Pakistan. They wanted to create that belt of madrasas, 25,000 funded by Saudi Arabia in most cases, funded by um, some US agencies as well. The purpose was not to allow those orphans to go into Pakistan, but study there, groom, get groomed, go back and fight. Because no one knew that in 1989 these Afghans will win. Everyone thought this is a long war. I want you to keep in mind this phrase, long war. Because that then establishes a certain way of thinking about these issues as well. The only point here is, this area, federally administered tribal area, was the base camp of these people. They stayed there. Our interest moved on, they stayed there. Second thing that happened in that area was, it was a tribal society, people of the mountain. They know guerrilla warfare very well. Having a weapon in their hands is a matter of their prestige. I, I myself, I was talking to um, one of the tribal leaders in that, era, in that area. And he said, when I asked him as a police officer, so why they were always carrying guns? Because as a police officer, not in that area, but, but close to that, it was problematic for me because they would move into the settled area of the Northwest Frontier Province. And they would say, well, it is a weapon for a Pashtun male is like jewelry for a woman. It, it is so central. So the people were armed. They knew about insurgency because historically so many people had gone there. The only major thing that changed, why, the, the reason why I'm giving you this background is that it was the tribal elders who were in the command position. And the tribals get all the money from all the outsiders as well because we wanted their support. We, wanted, we were taking over their area to create that base camp. We entrenched the role of the tribal elder in that area. But the economic disparities in that region were so intense that the there was a disconnect between the haves and the have-nots. So the have-nots, later on, after the Afghan war, stood up. They killed about 700 of those tribal elders. Not only killed, they beheaded them, which is very unprecedented. In the Pashtun culture, those of you who understand Pashtun culture, you will not even, all societies and all cultures respect their elders, but there are different ways you show that element of respect. In that tribal region, if your elder, your uncle, your father, your mother, they, they're sitting, you will not sit in front of them. You'll stand. The, the kind of respect that is seen as something very basic. For those kids to start killing their elders is something huge. In my view, what, hap what has happened is that the have-nots have taken over, killing the tribal elders, and this is a new nuisance value that they have created. It has empowered them. The slogan used for that is religious, of course. It is tribal as well. But they picked only those parts of the tribal culture which gel in well with their, in my view, very distorted religious culture. This is what has happened. So now, those extremists, when they saw that Pakistan military 
operated, started operating in that area for the first time, they reacted. And when they realized that the military has heavy weapons, they are well armed, what they did, they said the only way we can challenge them is by going into the urban centers of the country and making life terrible for them. This is what is happening. We only often see what those Taliban, this new uh, empowered have not community, what they are doing in Afghanistan, they are creating havoc in Pakistan as well. So that is one element. We can go into more detail if you want later on the Q&A. Second factor, this is now we have left this tribal belt crisis on one side. And if, if I may add just one word, we, we must remember these are Pashtuns who have historical blood, ethnic relations with the Afghans on the other side. Whenever there was a problem on the other side, people from this side went there. Whenever there was a problem here, people from Afghan side came here. So it is not that you just have a new modern system of customs, clearance, and uh, a new border that you will demarcate. It was Durand line. It was drawn in the sand. There's, there are dozens of area in that, uh, that, that region where there's no one knows which is Pakistan and which is Afghanistan. So that is also helping that region, <coughs> this issue on the side and come to the radicalization trends within Pakistan. And I'm still trying to profile all the militants or the extremists in Pakistan. The second groups are those which are either Kashmir driven, by Kashmir driven I mean those who want to fight and liberate Kashmir because of this Pakistan's uh, standard view that they, they, they um, always had a legitimate legal right on Kashmir. In the 1980s we saw when the Afghan war closed, some of those militants were redirected Pakistani government played a very important role. There is simply no denying the fact. The Pakistani intelligence played a role. The Pakistani military played a role in that. Because it was impossible uh, to, to fight India in a conventional way. And India, by the way, had done the same thing in Bangladesh. Um, Bangladesh crisis in 1971 was a creation of Pakistani um, policy blunders. But at the final moment, it was, it was Indian military which helped them. The Pakistani military so military um, structure still has that in the, their mindset. They always wanted to take revenge. So they had shifted these mujahideen, created new ones, sent them, directed them towards India. The problem was that those people who were going to fight in India and some in Afghanistan too, they had a radicalization agenda locally as well. You just cannot tell someone, I'm going to use you for a national cause, you'll cross the border, I'll give you a new passport, I'll train you, I'll give you a weapon, I'll ensure that you reach there safely and commit uh, a religious war or a war of independence, but when you'll come home, you'll have a different persona. It doesn't work like that. The, the brainwashing, the religious extremist worldview that was taught to them, that was ingrained, they used it for domestic reasons as well. They wanted to then radicalize um, the Pakistani society as well. So this regional foreign policy agenda of Pakistan in my view, uh, created this space for radicalization inside Pakistan as well. They, all of them used to be somewhat in the state control in varying degrees. Today, if there are 20 groups by my research, 17 of them are banned. They are getting um, the Pakistani military and the Pakistani law enforcement agencies are uh, making life difficult for them in Pakistan. But maybe three of those are still seen as assets for a long term um, or potential conflict with India those groups have a radicalization, a domestic radicalization agenda as well. And that's creating a lot of extremism and, and radicalization within the Pakistani society. So these were the two groups. The third point in this, and then I'll move on to the second group, is about whether Pakistan had a chance to tackle these um, in an, any effective manner. They, in my view, the counter-terrorism policy of Pakistan, now in the policy realm I'm talking about, it was absolutely, it, it is a failing policy. They were never very clear how to go against these militant groups. And they were not clear because most of the international aid that came to Pakistan was directed towards military. Now, all modern, all new research and studies will tell you that counter terrorism and counter insurgency, in essence, is a law enforcement issue. Please, if you are not clear about it, go just Google RAND. There's a study uh, by RAND Corporation say how, uh, how terrorist groups end or something to this effect. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's right on the f title page, you'll find it. They have looked at many studies and have come to the conclusion if you want to challenge 
extremists and militants, it has to be a civilian law enforcement process. Why? Because there's a difference between how military deals with an issue and how law enforcement deals with an issue. A military officer, in most cases, in most armies of the world, if in a campaign you use 10 bullets, at the end of the day you are asked, where are the 10 bodies, especially in South Asia? Police never fires to kill. Police fires to disperse because it is, it is moving under a certain law. For military, anywhere, in any, especially in South Asia, you declare Mr. X as a terrorist. Maybe that person X actually is um, part of the opposition, but it's easy. It, it's very convenient these days. You just declare someone Al-Qaeda and Taliban, and it is seen legitimate to kill them. The problem is, for police, they, they develop the profile. They develop the, 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 the prosecution case. Then you show to the audience, their supporters, this is what happens when you violate law. This is the system which really de-radicalizes or defeats terrorism. That was not done in Pakistan. Because somehow we thought, army being the most organized institution can do the counter-terrorism. There's a problem with the donor policy as well. My question to the international community is, um, why the focus was so much always on the military means. Of course, I'm making a political statement here as well. So the counterterrorism policy failed. The Pakistani police never got the resources. Um, so they were never actually real, had a real chance to defeat the extremists and, and, and militants. These were just the four points. But the, and the final point in this category is that there are conflicts simmering in that region, whether it is Kashmir, whether it is Afghanistan, whether it is Chechnya on that side, whether it is um, Xinjiang, um, now increasingly in China. So long as you will have conflicts, radicals and extremists will be produced out of that. So, but the question, the way I had framed it, whether extremists in Pakistan will define the future? I think no. The reason is, Yes, the number of suicide attacks have significantly increased. It is on my fingerprints, I, uh, finger points. I can tell you um, how many from 2006 to 2011. There is a significant rise from six in one year to about 95 in, in, uh, in, during the last year. But whether those suicide bombers can change or transform or have a deepening effect on the policy, I don't think so. There is a strong reaction against the militants as well. Just one example of Sabat where there's one of these mullahs, um, head of the Tehrike Nifaz-e Shariat-e Muhammadi, we call it TNSM, which had taken over Sawat. You might remember those media reports. Um, militants or terrorists are just 100 miles away from Islamabad. The same head of the, that institution, TNSM, was brought on the Pakistani television. And he was asked by a very smart and intelligent newscaster or anchor of the program, Salim Safi. The, the interview is on, on uh, YouTube. He asked them, so sir, uh, you want to establish a new Islamic state in Sawat? Uh, will you stay there or would you would like to expand? He said it provocatively. He said, no, at this moment we want it in Sawat. We want to expand it. So he was asked, what do you mean? I mean, your new Sharia-based system, what you think is Sharia, what will you do? He said, well, in our system, women will not be able to go out. Even if the only exception is if she is very ill and she's dying, maybe you can take her to hospital. Otherwise, you cannot take women out to hospital. The second thing was asked, so sir, do you believe in any democratic representative form of government? He said, no, of course, democracy is haram. What that smart journalist did was, he showed the real face of that person to the audience. Within a span of one week, there was a surge in public reaction against all what TNSM stood for. That led to a major military action in Sabah because military thought they had the public support and they did it quite successfully. Yes, they were human rights violations. The point I'm making, for the ordinary people in Pakistan, when you mention Sharia, they immediately think that we know the justice system which is in vogue, which is pathetic, which is not delivering. So they said the ideal Islamic system of justice and egalitarianism, they believe that, okay, this, it is that system which will be implemented, not knowing the faces of those Sharia-based systems today. The, that's why I'm saying people don't vote for religious parties in Pakistan, except in one case in 2002, when I think it was a manipulated election. General Musharraf wanted to show this to West, uh, that yes, if not me, then these radicals will be there. That's why 
he changed the criterion or requirement for a standing an election and the mullahs uh, won in one province. Otherwise, in all the elections that have taken place in Pakistan, religious political parties, now I'm not talking about the extremists of the Fatah, they don't stand for election, but these religious political parties, they never have got a chance. When they got a chance for those five years in, in Northwest Frontier Province, now called Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, they had a great time, they, they changed some policies as well. But my argument is, for the long-term reason, these religious extremist forces, they can create havoc, they can create a serious law and order situation, they can increase violence in the country, they cannot define the future of the country. If we come to the next group, liberals. Well, there are no liberals in the sense that you and I in US thinks of liberals. Um, the, the, the definition is slightly different, but I'm, by saying liberals, uh, I, I, I mean progressive elements, pro-democracy elements. Uh, look at the number of political parties, some people really get surprised that those, um, that the party currently that won in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, just bordering Afghanistan, you think of Pashtuns as warriors, as extremists, as ready to fire, um, any time they, they, they want to, that is all true. But the party that was voted in power is called Awami National Party, which was originally led by Abdul Ghaffar Khan, who was known as Frontier Gandhi. Why? Because he was a great friend of Gandhi. They were the ones who never even wanted to join Pakistan because it was being created in the name of religion. It's a quite a progressive party. Uh, yes, hardliners are also there, very well entrenched. I'm not denying that. I'm saying these liberals also not only exist, they get, not liberals, progressives, they also get into assemblies. Um, their performance may not be very good, very clearly. Um, incompetence may be their hallmark, exactly. Uh, but they, they exist, they, they have a certain space. Then, for instance, the number of human rights organizations. Um, Asma Jahangir is one leading human rights activist. There are many more uh, human rights organizations very active. However, there is a big crisis in Pakistan, in Balochistan, and I am not hearing enough voices from with mainstream Pakistan supporting the Balochis' right. It's, it's a secular movement that is going on. That movement has taken up arms as well. So, yes, Progressive elements are there, they get voted in the parliament, but by and large their performance has been pathetic. And there is, is, a, is a reason uh, for that. The reason is that whenever the democratic institutions start getting somewhat uh, strong, a democracy gets on its path, um, a military dictator comes in. So liberals, progressive elements do exist but their space is limited, their performance has been pathetic. But there was one thing for which I'm mentioning this progressive elements or I want to define. There was one very significant thing that, that happened in Pakistan, which unfortunately was largely missed in the United States and in the Western capitals. Uh, I'm often asked this question, being a self-proclaimed expert on Pakistan, uh, that so where is Pakistan's spring? There's an Arab spring, clearly, and I think this is one of the best things that I have that has happened to the Arab world, uh, and I tell them, there was a Pakistani spring two years ago, it was not in the headlines. It was the lawyers' movement. A lawyers' movement where hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, go and look it up in, in research papers and in mainstream media, hundreds and thousands of people, young people, coming out on the streets, defying a military dictator, saying that when he had thrown out uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pakistan that that was unlawful. This, they asked for rule of law. Why it was not covered as widely? To, to give credit, New York Times and Wall Street Journal later on did uh, some excellent stories on, on that, but um, very late in the game, I guess. We never recognized that effort because we, we had a certain image of narrow-minded, uneducated, backward people how come they're asking for rule of law in democracy and constitutionalism? Because it never was fitting in to the model, the image we had built for ourselves. So we missed that story. The people's power was so strong that they changed the dynamic. Musharraf was thrown out practically, though he resigned and he was shown the door um, in a somewhat decent manner, which was also good. But he, he had to leave his office and the Supreme Court's Chief Justice was restored, although the politicians also had a problem. The trouble was, everyone sided with this movement of lawyers, 
But then politicians in the military thought, well, maybe we don't actually want rule of law because it is our own patronage, political, uh, political system based on patronage which, which works for them, a very feudalistic system. And that would, will never change unless there's a continued democratic process. But coming back to the point, the, the judiciary movement, the lawyers' movement was one progressive thing. That shows at least that progressive elements have a chance. Why I am not pushing, putting much trust only in this elite, progressive elite, is that th there are no strong institutions in the country. There is very much like extremists can show violence, can have, can have a strong impact for a moment, but it's not sustainable. Unfortunately, despite this progressive element, despite lawyers' movement, we have not seen the fruits of this modernization, you can say, or democratic trend. So I am not putting much um, emphasis on the capacity of these progressive elements to actually define Pakistan. And I'll tell you, of course, ultimately, what I think, who will change Pakistan. The third group, let me profile that, military, very organized, disciplined, resourceful. However, in my assessment, there are also cracks in that system. And those cracks are evident from the number of attacks that we have seen on the military. The Pakistani mili military headquarters, GHQ, I think in 2008 or 2009 was attacked. It was very humiliating for the military. The number of Pakistani intelligence agents who have been targeted and killed, and we don't hear that because maybe, of course, we don't know who are the 25 most prominent ISI agents. But the radicals who believe are extremists, terrorists, or militants, whatever label you want to give them. They had started targeting, they, they were the ones who had a great alliance with the military. When they realized that military is actually now targeting them, they reacted. They said, you groomed us to fight in Kashmir and fight in Afghanistan, to fight jihad for you, and now you're giving up on us? We are not going to leave you. First, we'll take care of you, and then we'll go back to our battlegrounds. So military, and their military after all is a reflection of the society. There are people uh, with all kinds of views within the military as well. There have been cracks. Why I'm saying that most of the major attacks in the military installations in Pakistan happened because there was information from inside those organizations. Um, so again, the, th those cracks may not be very significant or not very large or not very obvious, but Pakistan army is no more in a position to really operate in a manner that it used to be. After all, why, coming to a current situation, why the Pakistani army is not going against the Haqqani group? There are a number of reasons. One, of course, it is the Pakistani military's worldview still that the biggest threat to them comes from India. The Pakistani army chief Kiani has given a few statements saying the biggest threats come uh, from, in, from radicalization inside Pakistan, and I trust him, I think he believes that. But for a big institution to change its direction, it's, it will take time. For the time being, they think of India as the, their biggest enemy, as well as United States, unfortunately and tragically, as it may sound. But let me stay on this India point. So they are not ready to give up their assets, or some people who are sympathetic towards Pakistan, they are not ready to give them up in Afghanistan or to go against them because they believe that India is investing hugely in Afghanistan as well. A lot of work India actually is doing in Afghanistan is development related. Uh, but there is a belief by the Pakistan, within the Pakistan army that they are doing some security intelligence operations as well. And they, if you look at the Pakistani map, you'll see this. India on one side, Afghanistan on the other. So they believe in it. They, they, they are sandwiched between the two. And they argue that if there's Indian forces on one side, and Afghanistan also is friendly to India. And by the way, Afghanistan has no border with India. There is no common border between India and Afghanistan. So Pakistan believes that they are being cornered from both sides. Hence, they, they argue that they will go against militant groups in a step-by-step -step fashion. They, they, this is their viewpoint. And they have not gone against Haqqani group because almost all the other major groups are now attacking Pakistan through suicide bombings, through violence, Haqqani group is believed to be one which is more directed towards United, uh, towards United States and Afghanistan, which is more focused on Afghanistan, which is a little far away, and it is not conducting any terrorist operations inside Pakistan. 
to say so they argue if they are only looking outwards and not looking inwards and by the way the haqqani group operates and belongs to not only pakistan but three border provinces of afghanistan as well the second argument pakistan army has they lack resources and they they are said okay you have 5 or 600000 people you are most resourceful uh, why don't you put all your army in the tribal areas and get rid of haqqani group they argue so for that to happen we'll have to leave uh, we have to move from the india border half of the forces are there and they are they are said if the biggest threat is from this side first take care of it they argue uh, we don't trust india what happens if we take off our forces from that border and their argument there is at least one uh, i think logical point there they argue that indian forces very clear we are also close to the border region they say okay india should withdraw their forces from the border region so we'll take away those forces the point i'm making this is a triangle um each side has a logical view point i even believe um india has a legitimate interest in afghanistan india believes that if they will con- if pakistan will be allowed to continue to support some of these militant groups ultimately they will get together in afghanistan again and use the new sanctuary in afghanistan against india so indian interests are also understandable and are some of those i, I think are very legitimate but these countries are so struck in terms of the, the the conflict of their interests and the geopolitics that that reality is there whether that reality should change of course whether india should take some steps to for confidence building in pakistan i think they must whether pakistan should stop uh, supporting haqqani group of course but the geopolitical realities are such that it will take a lot of effort so this is where pakistan military stands um they have a love hate relationship with united states um frankly they in some ways hate american policy but they love f16s they love american military equipment um and um somehow the other um military very expensive military equipment is also uh, also available uh, always apparently is for sale and that that's another topic uh, i have just moved from columbia to national defense university i often forget i am now uh, in in washington dc uh, so the point here is the pakistani military despite being resourceful lacks capacity to really make a difference yes they can support someone if there is some some other development major development like the judicial judiciary movement when people's effort had brought had encouraged the chief justice and it took actually according to the pakistani media a call from the pakistani army chief to ensure that that chief justice will take over that that was a good combination but in itself army has tried four times to rule con- the country and every time they left pakistan in a more pathetic situation so army's capacity to change pakistan i have my serious skepticism and i think they increasingly realize as well so coming to sort of the last part of my presentation um so i have explained extremists liberals and military and despite mentioning some of the good things they are doing except extremists uh, of course but despite explaining their capacity their strength their vigor their objectives i have also argued that none of them will be able to define the future so who will some of you might be able to guess what i am getting at and i must warn you what i am about to say may sound a bit rhetorical it may also sound subjective i i agree but i i genuinely believe that not only in other regional countries but in pakistan the ultimate power and authority and the agent of change it is always the ordinary people of that country we have invested so much in institutions we have looked at it through the lens of power structures in such a consistent fashion that we are no more able to see the ordinary people who stand behind these institutions again i'll mention three things you'll ask me so what have people of pakistan as a as a people as ordinary people have done anything that you are saying that they are the ones who who can and will uh, bring change to the country and i am not even comparing it to the arab spring where we have clearly seen how despite authoritarianism despite oppressive tactics their people um, can can bring change in very effective ways why in pakistan 
I'll just give you two examples and move on to my conclusion. One is Pakistan is one of the only few countries where in 60 years there were four military dictators who came. Please go open up your history book and see on all four occasions those military dictators were thrown out, humiliated. Only in one case uh, General Zia died in a plane crash so in that case uh, God was also very kind if I may say in that way. But if he would have stayed, he was in a very difficult situation. He was very unpopular. He would have been killed or thrown out for sure. Look at the last one year of, uh, of General Zia. But in, even in all other cases, and one general was very liberal, one was very progressive. Um, general Ayub was, um, played a very important role in economic development of Pakistan. There were some good things that they, these dictators did as well. But by and large, they were thrown out of the country. And it was always the people who made that happen by coming on the streets. Uh, Pakistan also produced um, the first prime minister of the country, Liaquat Ali Khan, uh, was killed um, by, by, by the bureaucracy, it is believed. Um, he was addressing a major gathering uh, in, a, in a public, he was pub addressing the public when he was killed. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, I think the most popular prime minister the country has produced, democratically elected, he was um, arrested. He was in prison. General Zia pushed him to go for a peace deal, inverted commas, said him, okay, go to Libya. Gaddafi said to him, I want to take him. The other people, uh, and it was not Gaddafi the way we look at him today. It was in the 60s, 60s we are, I'm talking about 70s. There was, uh, he had a different profile in some ways. But irrespective of that, there were many Arab countries who said, we want to take Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto decided, no, he's ready to be hanged. And he was hanged in a, through a, after a very controversial verdict. He was the most popular leader. He decided that he will go down, but he'll make an impact. So within Pakistan, with the ordinary people's support, there have been cases where people brought in change. I have two or three provocative recommendations, which I think can help Pakistan transform, but one first realization is also very necessary. That through, whether it is through IMF or World Bank, which have done important, significant things, but if anyone thinks that by just these IMF programs or by supporting democracy through military means or uh, through some other efforts as well that you'll be able to change any country from outside, I think that's a flawed worldview. It has to be internal. Often, we want to look at the countries and think, um, we want to create these agents of change. And we want to create new ones, which also like us. Rather than looking at the agents of change who are already there and supporting them. And in this age of communication and internet and communication, um, it's not that difficult to find those agents of change. For example, I'll just mention two people here. One is a person. Uh, we often talk about supporting Sufis once. And Sufis are those mystics um, believing in pluralism and, and tolerance who, who had brought Islam to South Asia initially. And I think that that is, uh, they still have the, the strongest group in Pakistan. And they are not necessarily either Shia or Sunni or Barelvi, they, they, they are a white group who still have a very strong base. But they, there was an effort to okay, start supporting Sufis without really knowing what impact that will have. As soon as the militants and extremists realize that the international community has decided that in some way they will try to empower these modern Sufis, there was a reaction. There was an unprecedented attack on, on Sufi shrines. This has never happened in the history of South Asia or actually to the best of my knowledge is it has never happened in the Arab world or any Muslim country as well. This has happened in the last four years. And we must try to understand why this new thing is happening. The extremists and militants, they will try to kill police officers. Maybe they will try to kill the military who is operating. Maybe they will try to go after Westerners, um, Americans, NATO and ISF. Why are they conducting suicide operations on Sufi shrines? Because they see that Suf they, they just hear the rumor 
that okay there is this change or shift in the policy at an international level or any one country is trying to help Sufis by the way that country or that international community has recognized it accurately that Sufis need support but the way it is done at times creates more issues of credibility so ultimately two names that I wanted to mention if, if I would ask anyone to support any person um, one person is um, by the name of Tahir al Qadri again without getting into any religious discussion or, or, or sectarian issue in, in, within Islam Tahir al Qadri has come up with a 600 page fatwa which I have had a chance to read um, um, in Urdu which is now being translated in English as well um, which is the most comprehensive document challenging the whole idea of suicide bombing and explaining and um, analyzing and proving in my view that suicide bombing has absolutely no justification under religion or under, under any framework. Uh, he has a strong base, he has many madrasas and many, uh, he has a strong network in Pakistan as well. I have so far not seen anyone from really, really supporting his ideas. Again, without, I am not suggesting that whatever sectarian group he represents, I am not trying to say I am supporting that group. I am saying just the idea and effort. And I am also making this argument that um, maybe um, it was much beneficial to support publishing houses in Pakistan um, than supporting any other project. Um, I hear from the Pakistani friends so often um, that we want to publish and they can't, if you want today to uh, produce something or publish something which is quite extremist, radical and pro-jihadi if I make all that, you believe me, you easily find publishers. But if you really want to challenge that, at times it is difficult, especially if it is in local language. For English, you can go to Oxford University Press in Karachi, there are other publishers as well. Another person was Javed Ghamdi. Uh, he has a website. Um, again, a Deobandi, traditional orthodox scholar, but the only one whom I have seen, only important one whom I have seen on Pakistani news network. By the way, there are 57 independent news channels in Pakistan. There is a kind of rivalry between different news, uh, different um, television um, outlets to, to hire him to run a program in religion. And he challenges extremists in a very effective way. Tragically, I must admit, uh, he was forced out. In a way, there were attacks. He now lives in Malaysia, but runs still a TV program from his website and his publications, which are popular. But two provocative thoughts, and with those I'll, I'll, I'll end. And I'm, I was given 40 minutes. I think I'm through with my time. One is to rethink, this is again for strategists and policy makers primarily, but also for you as students of history, that maybe it is advisable to take off our realist lens and look at this region. By realism, I mean political realism, where we have a certain definition through which maybe system work in the developed world, that may not always be the ideal criterion through which you will try to change things or manage things or tackle things in, in Pakistan on in, or in those countries. People there are going through a battle for survival. You can argue it means that survival is their interest and that will fit into the realism model, uh, but not, not really. I would argue we need to be the way I am using this whole phenomena of idealism I'm making the argument maybe we need to think a bit about idealism also and that may work and I, in my belief that will. The second point is we often think that our message of carrots and sticks will work and I'm talking about the Western capitals. Um, yes, it may work in ordinary circumstances and when we think and when we observe that our these carrots and sticks are not working, we say okay let's reframe the message my suggestion is also think about the essence of the message. I'm not saying to go for strategic defeat. I'm arguing for a creative adjustment of interests. The last point. These were just two thoughts which I want you to think about and take away from uh, this my humble uh, effort to explain things. But I'll conclude with this partly anecdotal, partly one example, why I think we should not lose hope in Pakistan. And I'll mention three people there. Uh, one was without, again, any political or religious connotations. One is Benazir Bhutto, the former prime minister. I remember my conversation with her 
when she was going back to Pakistan from New York. I was living in New York. And uh, because of my personal association with her in terms of I had worked under her when I was in bureaucracy in Pakistan, and also because of my police background, she asked me a basic question. And she asked, so what do you think about the law and order situation and my security? And my honest answer to her was, there are people waiting out there, whether those are Bethulah Mesuds or uh, whether those are the militants or anybody else. My view was they are waiting for her to kill her. And she said to me, you are not telling me something new. I know that. And I know I'll be killed. Or there's a high probability that I'll be killed. But she said that I believe that I owe this to Pakistan. I need to go back and fight it out. Second example, Salman Taseer the governor of Pakistan who was killed because he sided with a Christian lady, stood against blasphemy law. Again, I interviewed his police officials who were guarding him. I'm doing a major project on police reforms in Pakistan. And being a former officer, I, a police officer, I get a chance to interact with many police officers in Pakistan. They said, we told Salman Taseer very clearly, very categorically, you are going to get killed because you stood up against blasphemy law. And the, he said, OK, what do you want me to do? He said, we want you to go and apologize to people. I never meant to disrespect the prophet. I was just siding with this Christian lady. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. His close friends stopped traveling with him. It was so certain that he will be killed. He said, it's fine. I'm ready to be killed. And he got killed. Third example, Farooq Khan, a religious scholar, he went to Sawat after the big military operation, tried to establish a modern Islamic university in Pakistan, in Sawat. He also is on record. Go to Daily Times, you'll find a statement. Somebody said to him, what you are trying to do in the midst of militants, you will be killed. He said, that's fine. I need to stand for ijtihad, that modern reasoning within the political uh, Islam, or within the con context of a Muslim philosophy, religious as well uh, as political. And he said, it's fine to get killed. The point I'm making, and he was killed. He was killed right in his office last year. The point I'm making, and these three people, I'm not talking about these liberals or leftists who are in some corner without any support. These, are main, these were mainstream people. Benazir Bhutto, the, one of the most popular political leaders Pakistan has produced. Salman Taseer, a business tycoon and a politician. Farooq Khan, a credible Islamic scholar. My point is, there are so many more people like them. So long as you have people in Pakistan who are also ready, who are also ready to, to die for a cause which they genuinely believe in, and that cause is progressive and modern, and they want to stand up to extremists, so long as they have such people, we need not lose hope in Pakistan. That's also one message I think um, I want you to take away. Thank you very much for your patience in listening to my discourse.